Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. The, uh, I was gonna stop off at the guest center and fill out a visitor's card this morning. <laughs> you haven't seen me around for at least the last seven weeks. I, and I have been assigned an interim pastorship down in Subwayville until they get a new pastor. So I've been ministering down there for seven weeks and Pastor Ryan asked me if I could take a break there and sneak in today because uh, everybody's gone. The team's gone. Everybody's gone. Uh, there's 42 down in Florida for the uh, fine arts. And we have team members that are finally getting a break uh, from work and on vacation. And so we're really slim pickings. And so, yeah, when you're slim pickings, you go to the, what's at the bottom of the barrel and you scrape it up. And you bring it back alive again. Yay! Yeah. No, you know I'm only joking there. My wife and I, we've been working with Pastor Ryan all summer long with uh, Gifts of the Spirit on Wednesday nights. And it's been really going good. We've really enjoyed it. Uh, Pastor Ryan and, and Angela give me a few minutes to speak uh, from time to time. You, you that come to Wednesday night class know what I'm talking about. Because every time I start talking, they interrupt. They got more to say. But uh, we've been a great team, haven't we, babe? It's been really good. And I want to say something about what you just heard today. We, we got a message in tongues, and we got a word of encouragement, and, and then we got an interpretation from tongues, and what God was saying in this unknown language, which we really believe God does today. It is a supernatural work of a spirit, and there's, the supernaturalness of it is that God comes at the spur of the moment, on the scene, instantaneously, there's something he wants to say to the whole congregation. You know why he, one reason why he did that? One reason why? There's others. One reason? Because you're so open. Because you come in here, you open your heart, you worship the Lord, you sing unto him. Expect God to show up. Expect God to say something if he wants to. And that's what you do. And that's what he did. So praise the Lord. We want to welcome our guests today online and here. And we'd like to have you that are here to visit our guest table before you leave today, right outside the center doors, because we'd like to hear from you and get to know you um, and maybe leave some information about you and, and, and always invite you back. And do know today that the offering place, the ushers will be in the back, and there's some on the walls. You can drop an offering in. I would like to say thank you for your faithfulness. It's really rough in the summertime. We, we learned in the 40 years I pastored here, I learned that, uh, that, that the bills didn't go on vacation. They showed up faithfully. They, in fact, the bills were more faithful than church attenders were during the summer. And um, that, that's because you're on vacation and you're taking a break and you're getting things done and you're enjoying the, the summertime. So that's good. You need that. That's healthy for you. Uh, but at the same time, it's healthy to keep the church afloat too. Ooh, financially. So thank you for your faithfulness in, in that. And praise the Lord. And there will be prayer meeting tonight. And my wife and I are going to host a prayer time this evening. It's the first Sunday of the night of the month. And we will be hosting that this evening. So welcome again, guest, and you online for that. Praise the Lord. Well, I, I'm not sure if this is the last message I didn't hear from Pastor Ryan. I, I let, me, uh, let me see if he can't. It's not. Okay, it's not. Uh, all right. All right, very good. Found out that this is not the last message of this series, but it's part of the series that he's been doing. And he gave me an assignment and asked me if I would handle this particular one, and that's what we're going to do today. There are, there are two things that we would like to get accomplished. Is number one, better understanding our own salvation experience, how it all came about, how it came about and how to better maybe understand in and of itself, the very experience that we actually had when we gave our hearts to the Lord. We know that it's about a growth journey after that acceptance, and that's where sanctification, justification, uh, reconciliation, regeneration, all those fancy words in the word come to pass and come to existence as we walk with the Lord, as we continue to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the second thing we want to learn today, and be re, uh, in this, I'm calling this a workshop, by the way. It's like sitting in a giant Sunday school class, you know, having a workshop, uh, is 
how do I lead someone to the Lord? What, what are some of the steps I can take? And I'm not saying that everything will be all covered, but some very simple things that we can employ to help bring people to an experience that we have had. And the reason we want to do this is because of Romans 3.23. You know this verse, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so you may ask the question, why is your testimony so important? Because we've talked about this before. Pastor Ryan has talked about it. Others have talked about it. That our testimony becomes extremely important in the time in which we are living to bring people to an awareness and to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so why is your testimony so important? Well, Romans chapter 10 Verses 14 and 15 gives us four things to think about that tells us why our personal testimony today is important. In other words, coming to Christ, accepting Christ, and then just going on about my business is not enough. It is not what God had in mind or planned or in store for us. He had much more in store for that for us. So it says here in Romans 10, starting with verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's good news. Notice what it says. They call on the name of the Lord. That means they've opened their heart. You did at one point. Those of you here today that are saved, most of you are. I did. My wife did. We called on the Lord. We give our hearts to the Lord. And then it says, and this is where we come in after our conversion. You think about this. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? People don't believe in God today yet. We have to help them believe in God. And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? So if they do have questions about God, but if they never hear about God, how will they know what to believe about God? And how can they hear without someone preaching or sharing or or talking, conversing to them. Which means now I have to become involved because I know what I believe. They don't know what they believe yet. But I have to, because what I believe, be the one to be the one to tell them. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? So ladies and gentlemen, we today are officially the sent ones. When you walk out here today, think about something subconsciously and consciously in your brain. I am sent. I'm sent by God when I walk out of this place today. I'm a sent one. Jesus did say in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, go and make disciples of all nations. So our job is to walk out as sent ones to make disciples of all nations of all those that are around us. This is how important you are. This is how important you are. We are the key to the harvest in these last days. We're the key. We're the sent ones. We're the ones that already believe. We're the ones that are going to help them believe and help them know God. And yes, there's so many different views out there about God and church and Christianity, but I'm going to help us with that because there's something that God can do today in us that can make all the difference in the world regardless of the rhetoric that's out there against us. There are three types of conversion, and there's only one that really works. I've talked about this before over the years, but we have a lot of new people, so... uh, I ran this past Ryan. I wanted him to be aware of what I was preaching on. As you know, I don't uh, take anything for granted. I come under our new pastor, just like you do. I and my wife come under Pastor Ryan. So I ran this stuff by him, and he absolutely put his blessing upon it. Because it's an area that gets a little tricky when you explain conversion. Number one, there's what's been called mental conversion. It's been called an intellectual conversion. The intellectual conversion says, 
that I heard a message on the plan of God. I agree with what I heard. When I walk out here today, I'll try to be a better person. That is not conversion. That's just a switching of one's thinking and switching their gears up, thinking that if I go out and be a better person, a good person, I'll get to heaven. Because there's a lot of teaching out there that does teach if you're good people, you'll go to heaven. And that is not biblically correct. You can be a Christian and definitely be a good person after that, by the way, and you'll get to heaven. But I can be as good as I want to be, but that's not going to get me in heaven. Just being a good person does not get me to heaven. The Bible makes that very clear. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, not of good works, right? Not of good works. That is not what saves us. Good works does not save us. We do good works after we're saved, but good works do not save us. Then there's the emotional conversion. This is what's been called the emotional catharsis conversion. It's where somebody has been moved by something about God. They've been moved by the presence of God. They won't deny that. Something moved them. Something touched them. They came out. They had this emotional release at the altar or at home or in their car or wherever. They have this emotional release and they let out this emotional pain, etc. And then when they get up and they go out and they live their life, that emotion begins to come down and it subsides and life goes back to normal as usual. But they forgot to pick something up at the altar when they left. They forgot to take Jesus with them into their heart. All they had was a release and not a commitment because of the release to God. Which brings us to our third type of conversion that works. And it's been called the heart conversion. It's where the heart is touched. And the heart changes. Most of the time, 85% of the time in the Bible, you find the word heart in the Greek or Hebrew, it's going to make reference to the mind. The heart is equal to the mind, to the thinking capacity of a human being. And, and, and therefore, that intellectual part, that thinking mind part, where they work together. It's good when you invite Christ into your life. Not just go out and try to be a good person. Not just have an emotional experience thinking, I'm different now. Not if you didn't take Christ with you. You just had an experience, but you didn't have a conversion. This is important. You see, a heartfelt conversion involves the intellect, the will, and the emotions. We are an emotional being. We're made up of intellect, will, and emotion. And so all three are a part of this conversion experience. Because it becomes a total commitment and acceptance of the fact that Christ has become more than just a thought, more than just a feeling, but I'm submitting now my intellect, will, and my will and emotion to the acceptance of Christ as Lord and Savior. So now I've made a commitment to not just a thought, I don't just have a good feel, but now I've chosen to choose and to accept and to submit and to yield my heart and life to Christ as Lord and Savior. In other words, I take him with me when I leave this experience. He's now in me, so now he goes with me, and now I recognize I am sent. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 shows us how well how uh, we come into this experience and what we need to know to guide others. So Romans 10, 9 and 10 is how we come into the experience, but then how I can help others to know Christ. I'm going to read, first of all, from the NIV, which I believe is on the screen. It says, if you declare what your mouth, with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart, say heart. heart. Notice it didn't say intellect, but the heart means mind too, but this intellect didn't say emotions. It says with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It's with your mouth. Your mouth professes this. 
Now, I want to read it from the King James because there's something buried in King James Version that takes us into a, I feel, a, a deep understanding as to what happens when we become a Christian. And it says it this way, same verse, that if thou shalt confess, say confess, yes. with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart, say heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession. Come on, when I do this, you know what that means. Confession is made unto salvation. Now watch this. Confess here means three things. Now, you theologians, I want you to go home and check me out. Make sure you do your homework and follow up on Pastor Kuhn today and make sure that uh, he's entitled back into the pulpit in the future. But there's three things about confession here that I discovered in the original language that brings a whole new understanding and a much deeper understanding and a much more convicting understanding of what I did when I gave my heart to the Lord. There's only a few times that the word confess is even used in the entire Bible. It's only like three, four times, something like that. And it has to do with confessing Christ or confessing sins. That's, that's the use of it in Scripture. I, I know there's whole movements out there about confessing this and confessing that, but the, the, the Scripture makes it very clear what confession is. And so confess implies three things. Number one, it implies that when I confess Jesus is Lord, and by the way, when you confess, you usually are admitting something, aren't you? So when you confess that Jesus is Lord and you confess your sins, you are saying three things. Number one, I agree that I am wrong. It's an agreement covenant you're making. I agree that I'm wrong. Number two, I agree, therefore, because I'm wrong, something has to be right. If there is wrong, there's a right. So in the Greek, the word confess here meant not just confessing that I'm wrong, but confessing that Jesus is right. And then I found in the original studying of this, in the Greek, that there was a third component that said this. If I'm going to confess that I'm wrong, if I'm going to confess that he is right, because if there's a wrong, there has to be a right, then I am confessing that I will always be wrong from this day forward, and Jesus will always be right because his word is always right when I live my life for Jesus. Now, folks, that is deep, and that is convicting. I'm going to tell you why. Because it means I cannot walk out of this place today and just act the way I want to act. I just can't do what I want to do unless it's all good. I can't act the way I want to, unless it's all good and proper and biblical. I can't just say what I want to say unless it's biblical. I can't just think what I want to think unless it's biblical. I can't read what I want to read unless it's a biblical approved thing. You understand what I'm saying? Ladies and gentlemen, I just can't go out and be the way I used to be. Not if I have gotten saved and made Jesus Lord of my life. I must do the changing. And that's where the growth comes in. That's a whole new series. But that's where growth comes in. So um, why is this so important? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. You asked some really good questions here. And here's the reason why this is important, what I'm saying. is so we do not allow past behaviors to creep into our newly changed life. You see, the enemy comes knocking at your door. Hey, you remember me? You need to let me in. We used to have a lot of fun. We used to do a lot of stuff. We used to go places, do things, read things, say things, watch things, eat things, drink things. We had a blast. You need to let me back in. What you and I do today is something a little differently. We take that door and we, we slam that door and we, before we do, we say, let's tell you what, Satan, the new landlord of my life is coming to meet you here at the door in just a moment. I'll see you later, buddy. And you slam the door in his face and you let your new landlord... You let your new landlord come in and step in and he'll open that door. He'll take care of him. You go on about your business for the kingdom. 
This is why this is important, ladies and gentlemen. We do not want to allow past behaviors to creep in our newly changed life. Where our intellect, where our will, and where our emotions, and where our body, our soul, our mind, and our spirit are completely and 100% totally yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ of our lives. Then you turn right around and you sit there and ask me another important question. You know what that question was? How important is this? Man, you take this thing further, don't you? You, you folks dig deep. How important is this? Well, let me tell you how important is this is. Now listen carefully. Because outside of God working by his spirit, because there's many ways in which he chooses to work, our testimony, say testimony, becomes the greatest tool God uses to change lives. Now let me explain that. Outside of all the other things that God can do to a person to get them to come to that place where they want to accept Christ, our testimony outside of that becomes the greatest tool that God has to change lives. So, yeah, you're going to ask how and why is that? <laughs> well, let me tell you why. How are we going to convince the world if they do not see a convinced, changed life? If we're going to proclaim that he's everything, if he's going to proclaim that he is all in all, if we're going to proclaim that he's our everything, then we are going to have to be convinced first so that we can convince them because it is our testimony that convinces them that what we say we are and who we have is a fact of our lives because it's in our behavior, it's in our fruit, it's in our conversation, it's in our attitudes and demeanors, it's in our lifestyle. And so they see that and it makes them want to have what we have. People will want, people will need to know what Christ has done for us. Now let's get simple here on this. The woman at the well, when she came before Christ, um, she uh, went into town after she was transformed by Christ. And by the way, Jesus was sitting there waiting for food, so he must have been, uh, the human part of him must have been on the hungry part. He's at the well, thirsty. He's sitting there resting. These are three important things for people today. Resting, quenching our thirst, and food for sustenance for strength, isn't it? Jesus could have said to the woman at the well, see you later, I'm taking a break. He, with all three of those conditions prior for him, or present for him, he still took the time to invest in this woman's life. Ladies and gentlemen, when you walk out of here today, you will be tired, you'll be thirsty, and you're going to want to eat, but there's going to be people all around you that need spiritual life. So don't be so overcome with natural needs that we're not taking care of the spiritual needs of other people. Amen? Amen. So the woman at the well goes back into town and many believed on Christ because of her testimony. First female evangelist in the New Testament. Don't tell me God can't put women in the ministry. Amen, women? And so she became the first female evangelist and people came out, got saved in town. But a whole bunch came out to meet Jesus and more people believed on Christ when they came and heard him. All because of one woman who went out and began to share her personal experience, her change, her testimony. God used it for a revival to take place in the town she lived in. One testimony. There's over a thousand testimonies in this church. Think what God can do in Kent County, in Delaware, with your testimony. Remember the man that was healed of a demon, delivered of a demon, in Luke chapter 8, I know the last time I preached, I think I mentioned this story, but I want to bring it back again. Remember, he wanted to follow Christ after he was delivered and be a part of the team. And he said, in essence, he says, no. Uh, the day I call it, the message I called it, the day Jesus said no. Um, he, he didn't usually say, say no, but he was saying no to him. You can't follow me. And it's like, what? I'm a Christian. I can't follow you? What do you mean? Well, yeah, we do follow him in many, many, many ways. But you know what he told this man? I want you to go back to your hometown and tell everyone what God has done for you. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants us to walk out our day and tell everyone what God has done for us. 
Are you convinced enough in your salvation that you can walk out of here and help others know Christ and become convinced so they can believe in God, accept God, accept Christ as their Savior as you did, as I did? You know, I asked the church down in Selbyville that I've been pastoring now, and I've been walking them through a transition. I did a series on how to transition between pastors, and then we're doing a series on evangelism. I asked them if they'd like to hear about evangelism. They all raised their hands. So we're doing an evangelism series down there right now. And I asked them the same question I asked you before, two or three times over the years. How many people have walked up to you in the last year and tried to present the plan of salvation to you? Not one person, as here, not one person can raise their hand. So all these people, I said, do you realize, they're a church of about 30, 40 people. So I took, I took 30 people and I times it by 365 days. I said, this past year, for one year now, there's been 18,250 times somebody could walk up to you and ask you if you knew the Lord. 18,250 times for 30 people to ask, to figure out if they, you know the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a scary thought. That's a scary thought that there couldn't be one out of 18,250 opportunities in one year for somebody to ask you if you know the Lord. What does that tell you? It tells you that the church isn't convinced enough to go out and tell somebody else to convince them. That's a scary thought. You're not that kind of church. I know a lot of you. But we want to make sure we are all on the same page that we're going out there to convince the world that Jesus is the truth, the life, and the way. This was... This is, this is what we're supposed to do, by the way, aren't we? Because we are the sent ones. But pastor, I'm concerned about their questions or responses. I'm concerned. I'm, I'm, and, and I'm gonna be, we're, we're human, we're natural. I'm fearful of what I won't be able to handle. I'm concerned about that. You know, fear doesn't always mean something bad. It can just mean I'm concerned about something. It sounds fearful. You know, it's a little bit scary to, how do I know what to say? Well, first of all, I'm one that believes that God will give you what to say. I just believe what the Bible says, and he'll give you what to say. But uh, here's some of the things that they'll say. What do I have to give up? Now, the things I'm going to share with you are the things over the years in my campaigns with people are the things I would hear. Or what will my family or friends think? That was probably one of the biggest. Eh, I got some friends, man. They're, it's going to be real. I got family. They don't buy this stuff. I remember going to Bible school with a girl, and, and she was in Bible school because she got kicked out of her home. Why did you get kicked out? Because I became a Christian. So she came on to Bible school to go in the ministry. She kicked out of her home. A lot of people fear that. Or what if he calls me to a mission field? I was witnessing to a guy. He was a businessman, lucrative businessman, had lots of money, and he, he was comfortable in his job. And I would, I would debate and debate, debate with him. Buddy, you've got to give your heart to the Lord. He said, man, I, I, I'm afraid the Lord's going to call me to the mission field, man. He didn't want to give his heart to the Lord because he thought he was going to call to the mission field. We, he, he finally caved in later and, and gave his heart to the Lord, but he thought he was going to be called the mission field. And I'm thinking, so what if you are? I didn't say that out loud because I didn't want to scare the guy more, but, but you know, that's, that's God's business. He takes care of that. And, and then here's one. What if I can't make it? I, I don't know. It just seems so hard. I don't know if I can make it. And that's where they come in with this. They, they, they know they're going to have to give up some things. They may not have to give up some things. They may have to change their lifestyle and schedule. They start thinking about all this stuff while you're talking to them. And, of course, the enemy's on the other side putting stuff in their brain, and they have their own ideology of life they've heard over the years. And then here you are with the good news, the best news on the face of the earth, and, and they're, they're debating within themselves. But, but here's, here's what I want to say to you uh, about the person who doesn't know if they can make it. Here's what thing you can say to them. I have. This is exactly what you tell them. Well, I have. And that's what I tell them. Yes, you can make it. I, I, I wouldn't be wasting my time with you if I didn't think you could make it. I wouldn't be wasting my time if I, wasn't, if I was worried about thinking you'd be called the mission field. And besides, if God, and I don't say this to them, but if God did call the mission field, he'll take care of everything else anyways. You, you, they, they're they're going to need some discipling, aren't they? That's why pastors are so big on discipling, little folks. My wife calls it spiritual abortion. You know, we don't believe in abortion in this church. Amen? 
all right, then we don't believe in spiritual abortion, then do we? And when they get saved, if we don't go after the new babes in Christ and nurture them and develop them, disciple them, they're going to fall through our fingers. And that's called, as my wife called it, she been this years ago, it's called spiritual abortion. We don't want to let people slip through our fingers, so we disciple them. So even when you're trying to convince somebody with these fears they have to get saved, you will trust the Lord to give you the responses because none of them have to hold true. Yes, you can be used of God to influence your family and friends. Do not not get saved because you're afraid of that won't please them. Get saved so God can use you to lead them to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Reverse that thinking. Reverse that thought process and let God use you to bring him to Christ because there is an eternal life coming or eternal damnation. By the way, we still do believe in hell in this church, right? Uh huh. We just don't believe in it for ourselves because we know Christ. But there is a hell. There's preachers preaching today there is no hell. Thus there is. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. And what you are giving up is your heart is what you tell them. But you're just, you're giving your heart over to the Lord. Just trusting God with your heart. And Jesus is going to take care of us of all your questions. With some help and some guidance, he will help you through those questions. But what you're giving up today, and I would tell them all the time, no, you're simply giving your heart to the Lord. It's time to move them into the big question. And that question is, would you like to have a relationship with Jesus? Now, this is after you have been working with somebody. Uh, I found that uh, when I picked up hitchhikers, I don't pick up hitchhikers anymore unless God says to. I don't. I stopped that years ago because of the law and because of safety issues. And uh, I was prepared to win somebody to the Lord in 60 seconds or 60 minutes. It depended on how long the ride was. I literally was trained to win souls in a 60-minute plan to a 60-second plan. And so I figured if I'm in the car going 35, 40, 50 miles an hour, you ain't jumping out, so I got you. <laughs> and I, I picked up a hitchhiker one time. I was in New York doing um, uh, evangelism or doing uh, services for a friend. And I went by myself. And on the way back, I saw a hitchhiker, so I picked him up. Picked him up in New York, drove him all the way across to, to Indiana, then I drove up into Michigan. And I told him I was a preacher. And they said, no, you're not. I don't believe that. I said, well, I am. No, I don't believe that. I said, well, I, I didn't know why. I, I, didn't, I don't know what a preacher is supposed to look like, but they didn't think I was a preacher. So I said, well, my briefcase is in the back seat. Why don't you bring it in the front seat? So they brought it to the front seat, opened it up. I said, there's some sermons I preached. Read them. They had plenty of time to read my sermons. I had a chance to present the plan of salvation. They weren't going nowhere. You go 60 miles an hour, they ain't going nowhere. <laughs> I sat in my dialysis chair five hours. I'm not going anywhere. My technicians and nurses, they're not going anywhere. They're assigned to me that day. Guess what I am? I'm assigned to them. I can let it roll. And I do let it roll because they can't go anywhere. And so that word can set in their spirit. And germinate and grow because of the seed that you are planting out there in this community. Plant the seed, plant the seed, plant the seed, and you're going to watch God grow that seed. So keep to the central theme when you ask if they're ready to accept Christ. A relationship with Jesus, not the name of a church. Make sure they know this is about a relationship, relationship, relationship with Jesus. Remind them of Romans 5.8. Which says that God commends us love toward us and that while we were still sinners, yet sinners, Christ died. He didn't die for Christians. He died for sinners to make us Christian. And then we got the scripture in, in Romans 6.23. A lot of people thought, well, shouldn't that have been read earlier? No. They need to know what it is now. For the wages of sin is death. The, right, the direction you're going now is, is spiritual death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so there's an eternity ahead of us. And if you choose Christ, you get to step into the eternity right now. You don't wait till you die, go to, into eternity. You are entering, according to Hebrews, you enter into eternity. As soon as you're saved, you enter into a spiritual eternity with Christ. 
you into a spiritual eternity with Christ. Now, you know that job that you hate a lot of times. They laughed at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock service too. Because a lot of people don't like their jobs. But I want you to stop and think about them. And I'm not saying this is true to everyone, but I believe there's some this may apply to. Why do you think God has you where he wants you? Folks, I shared with a couple of people recently, I don't want to be in, di- in dialysis, but I'm grateful that I can be there because it has restored a whole new body for me. But can I tell you the bigger reason why I'm accepting the importance of why it's so important that I'm there when I would like to have strong, healthy kidneys, which they're not totally gone, but they're not where they should be. Do you want to know why? Because God has given me an opportunity to see change in a lot of people's lives on a weekly basis. He's given me a new assignment, folks, a new assignment. And... I, I told brother and sister Dwight Dillard that I will stay there as long as the Lord wants me to. I'm willing to go, Lord, but I'm willing to stay there if it means their eternity. I'll stay there and I'll take the treatments. Why do you think God has you where he has you today? Stop and think about it. It may be tough. It may be hard. It may not be pleasant. But you know what? That could be one reason why God allows you to be there because you are the change maker through Christ. You are the difference maker in someone's life. You can bring people into the kingdom. A guy goes off to lunch one day, and I'm going to close. A guy goes off to lunch one day, and as he goes to lunch, he writes his boss a note, and he says, you know, I, I, I just, I'm not liking my job. You, 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 all the hard stuff's dumped on my desk. I got the job doing the hard stuff, the difficult stuff. And I, I'm really exhausted from it. I just want you to know how I feel, boss. And he goes to lunch. He comes back. His boss has gone to lunch. But he finds a note on his desk. It was a simple response from his boss. And his boss said, why do you think I hired you? He wanted him to do the dirty hard work. Ladies and gentlemen, God puts you where he puts you. Because he wants you to do the work. He wants you to be the convincing element to help someone believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as you walk out of here today convinced of your own salvation, you can help them to walk out and become convinced that they need God, that they need God. Should they respond positively, let them know that a simple prayer will change their life. Let them repeat that prayer after you. If someone says they want to think about it or need more time, guide them. And what they can pray. In fact, I have a suggestion for you. And I'm going to talk to Pastor Ryan. Perhaps the church can produce this. But there was a young lady that I went to high school with named Valerie. And I witnessed to a lot of kids. Some got saved. Some didn't. And Valerie was one of these girls that we were just good friends. We walked back and forth to school together. We were never boyfriend and girlfriend. We were just friends. And... And I would preach to Valerie, and I, I did it for so long, I, I could get this boy. I said, Valerie, please, you've got to accept Jesus. You've got to accept it. We're walking down the aisle together, back of Gloria. We're getting ready to graduate from high school. I said, Valerie, you've got to give your heart to the Lord, please. And I remember the words to this day. She said, when I get older, I'll think about it. So many people say that to you when they're young. And I want you to know something. To this day, and even last week, to this day, ask the Lord, don't tell you. I pray for Valerie. I said, Lord, I don't know if Valerie has given her her heart to the Lord. I don't even know if she's still alive. And I prayed this for all of my friends I witnessed. But Lord, if they're still alive, Lord, please, please save them. Get them to that place where they can know the Lord. If she's still alive, I still pray for her. I make a commitment for eternity to pray for my friends that I've witnessed to and family that I've witnessed to. Prepare a card. Get a three-by-five card. Put a simple prayer on it. Now, we're going to show a prayer in just a moment, but here's a prayer. Lord, I'm coming to you because I need you. Forgive me my sins. I confess you as Lord and Savior and receive you into my heart. Simple prayer. Put that on a three-by-five card. 
if you've been witness to somebody and they're on that borderline and, and they just don't want to bite, say here, one day you may need this. You know what I find interesting? When I pray for people on their deathbed, and I prayed for, I led a lot of people to the Lord over the years on their deathbed. And I, I found something interesting. You know all those questions I read that they use to resist accepting Christ? I find it interesting on their deathbed. They don't bring those questions up. All of a sudden, they're facing death. All of a sudden, they want Jesus because they know it's the end of life. Ladies and gentlemen, don't wait till the end of life to accept Christ today. Don't wait till the end of their life to miss the opportunity because they were never told. Never told. How many came up to you this week? Shows you what's going on. Let's be the difference maker. Let's be the ones that go out there and we offer people. Give them that card. Give them that card. I know there's a few takeaways on the screen. Today I think there's three takeaways. Uh, gentlemen, I believe was there was. Uh, you know what? We'll make sure. Don't worry about it. We'll make sure they're online. Yeah. I can't read them anyways. I'm half blind. We'll make, we'll make sure they're... I'm getting cataract surgery soon and that'll take care of that problem. Don't get old. Just don't get old. Ask the Lord to put a stalemate on you there. But it's all right. It's all good. It's all coming together. He's keeping us functioning. Uh, best to put the prayer of salvation up there, though. But uh, and we'll make sure those takeaways, hunt are online, I'm, I'm sure. So if you're here today or you're online today and you feel you're ready, this is the day to pray that prayer. This is the day to pray that prayer. And I'm going to, because of my limited eyesight there for the distance, I'm going to ask you, and I passed this by Pastor Ryan. He was fine. And with my wife, I want to make sure I had their blessing. Yes, it's okay if they just read it and we don't have to say it and they repeat after us. Others have done this before and they've told me, oh, I prayed the prayer that was on the screen. It's beautiful. If you don't know the Lord today, pray this prayer. Pray this prayer. If you are online and you're not seeing this prayer, you pray, Lord, I am coming to you because I need you. Forgive me of my sin and I confess you as Lord and Savior and receive you into my heart. Pray a simple prayer, letting them know you want him to come in. And folks, as anybody here may be praying this prayer, we want you to visit our Welcome Guest Center. Please let us know. I beg you, please don't let us do half the job. Let us do the whole job to help you walk in the Lord by going to there and giving us your name and contact information so we can reach out to you with some materials and to help you grow in the Lord. Same with online to contact the church. So I'm going to be praying, though, for those that today that need to make a recommitment to the Lord. While you're praying to accept the Lord for the need to, I'm going to pray for the rest of you that need to do a renewal or a recommitment, a reconsecration to the Lord to make sure that when you walk out of here, you are convinced of your change in Christ. Of course, the altars are open. If you need special prayer for anything, the altars are open. The people will come pray with you. And if you choose to come down to renew your commitment to the Lord, accept Christ, you can do that too. This altar is always open, as Brother Jake said. So folks, let's pray. And you that are receiving the Lord today, please pray that prayer. It's part of the plan that God has for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just come to you and we thank you, Lord Jesus, today that you are in this place. Thank you that you are in our lives, our hearts. We invited you in, not just in the intellectual way, not just in the emotional way, but also with our will. We chose to accept you. So we accept you into our body, soul, mind, and spirit, to our total being, to become totally committed and yielded to you, Lord Jesus. Now, God, we understand we are the sent ones, and we renew ourselves to you today. We commit ourselves to you today. Feel rechallenged today to go out of this place and do something with our testimony that you gave us. It's our personal testimony as the woman at the well, as the demon from the man that was delivered from demons, 
it was his personal testimony that witnessed. It's our personal testimonies that witness and let our light shine. And we're all called to it. We are your disciples. We are everyone that in the sound of my voice that are Christians. It's for all of us. There's no such thing as someone saying, well, that's not my job. That's not biblically true. And they can go home and check me out, Lord. What's biblically true is that we are all called to this mission. Bless, we pray, Lord. Strengthen, we pray, Lord. Encourage, we pray, Lord. Thank you for the lives that are being changed and for the growth in you. And thank you for watching over us. And be with the team as they come back from uh, uh, Florida and all the other folks that are traveling and those that will be traveling. Just watch over and continue to protect them and our communities. And we be careful to give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you.